Thank you so much for standing and worshiping the Lord tonight. Now, let me say uh, from the beginning tonight that I definitely, uh, oh, I guess Aftershock Kids call Sister Roni. Sorry about that. Call Sister Roni. <clears throat> let me say from the beginning, I've, everybody has a sheet of paper with which to write notes on. Now, I do this for a couple different reasons. Number one, uh, you know, the Bible says uh, much study uh, is greatest of the flesh. Okay, so whenever a, a pastor or a preacher pours their heart into studying, it just really makes us feel good when you take notes. And don't worry, we know when you're taking notes and when you're doodling. Because there's something about it. Be sure your sins will find you out. Like when you leave and you forget your paper sitting on your seat. Oh, the stories we can tell about papers left behind. Tell them on your seat. And uh, we're speaking of seats. This is going to mess with that little spot of OCD I have. I'll fix that. Thank, thank you, Brother Connor. Okay. So, uh, I do want you to take notes. We are talking about apostolic lifestyle. Everybody say apostolic. Apostolic. And lifestyle. Lifestyle. Now, what is so amazing to me about apostolic lifestyle, and I, I really want to begin this series. First of all, I'm not going to cover everything in one deal. This is going to be uh, drawn out, and I want it to be. I want it to be drawn out. I want us to do our best to not leave any stone unturned. Now, I will tell you that um, any time that I get up here and teach or preach, I hope that this church has the confidence to know that I have been to God in prayer. Okay? I, I try not to make it a practice of standing up here just shooting off the mouth, whatever I think. Okay? That is, and I know it's hard to believe for, you know, sorry. But the truth of the matter is, I do go to the Lord in prayer. So, I, as I bring scriptures, as I bring things to you, please know that these are things that I have in my own ministry that I have prayed about. That I have sincerely sought God uh, concerning for my own ministry. And so, I've often wondered, you know, people talk about how they trust their pastor. And they trust, you know, they trust him with their family, their finances, their life. But then there's other things in their lives that, well, we don't really trust him. Well, if I deliver scripture to you and I give it to you, that element of trust should be there. Or, you really shouldn't trust uh, your pastor with any other thing if you don't trust him with your soul. Amen? Amen. All right. So, but that's just kind of a little disclaimer. But it, what I want to do is focus tonight in this first lesson about apostolic lifestyle, what it is and what it means. And then we're going to get into all the, we're going to talk about the principles and then all the particulars uh, in, in living this lifestyle. So I want to begin talking about this very important subject, apostolic lifestyle. Now, we've been dealing with consecration and preparing ourselves for a work of God. So um, let, let me remind you while we're talking that in this vein of what we're talking about, we want more than anything else to please God. Amen. Amen. Not man. Right. We don't want to please man. We want to please God. And when I say we don't want to please man, let me be very clear that what I mean is our goal is not to choose what man's idea is concerning our lifestyle. Okay? We will want to pick that over what God's idea is. I want to have God's idea for living an apostolic lifestyle. So when a lot of times when that is said or when that is heard, we don't want to please man. It automatically reverts to this, what the preacher or the pastor says. So then man would then equal pastor, preacher, or teacher. But when we say we don't want to please man, that also includes yourself. We don't want to live as to please ourselves. We don't want to view things in the Word of God for any reason, no matter what they are, to just make it fit what we want it to fit. We don't, I've often said, it's been said by many before, we don't change the Word of God to fit our lifestyle. We change our lifestyle to fit or to line up with the Word of God. So, we've got to approach the Scriptures with a very open mind. We have to listen to the voice of God concerning the Scriptures. Now, when we talk about holiness standards, as a lot of people call them, and I like to refer to them and, uh, in, in a way, as apostolic lifestyle. And the reason being is because holiness and standards have really been taken a lot of heat. They've really suffered a lot of abuse through the years, just, just in those words. And, you know, instead of lifestyle convictions or lifestyle choices that are of an apostolic nature, 
It's no doubt that they've been beaten up. And mostly because people do not understand what they are. Right. If people genuinely understood what the word holiness... I mean, it, let me just say this. It should not be that at any time we should use the word holiness and want to hide our face when we say it. Right. 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 Nobody should ever want to say holiness and go like this. I mean, we're, we're, we believe in home. That's not the way we should do it. Right. For, for example, uh, through the years, and I'll talk about this later on in, in, in later lessons, but the, the lines have been blurred so much that people in the church age, uh, and, and you may not think, you know, I'm not saying this everywhere, but a lot of people don't use terminology like we used to in the day. <laughs> like worldliness. Anymore, if you are talking about worldliness, you know, you kind of, you, people automatically mark you. Folks, worldliness is still real. Yes, right. Right. And holiness, by all means, is still real. Yeah. Right. But we have to understand what it is. We do not want to give it a negative definition or make it a negative term. So I prefer parts of our uh, lifestyle that are, are strong convictions for us. And that's how I look at it. So I, I will not say someone, especially a new convert, is less spiritual because they do not understand this yet. Okay, let's make that very clear from the beginning. I will never say that a new convert is less spiritual because they don't have all the, you know, all the dotted eyes and cross T's yet. But it's just never gonna, I don't ever want to say that. They are very, very important to us, and they do deal with our lifestyle. So I want to start with scripture. Let, let's look in the Word of God at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 23. Again, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you to turn there. Because it's so much neater when I hear the pages turn. And, uh, and I am going to get some help reading tonight. <clears throat> Brother Wallace, if you would uh, give me a hand reading tonight. And, and I want you to I want you to listen as you read these scriptures. We're gonna we're gonna look at some things, some interesting things that I believe will open your eyes and and uh, hopefully give you some new insight, maybe things you didn't have before. That would be great. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Go ahead and read both. Pause. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Now, if you look at that word holy, that's not H-O-L-Y. That word is W-H-O-L-L-Y, okay, which means totally or completely. Everybody say holy. holy. It means totally, it means totally, it means completely. So then it goes on in the verse to say, your spirit, soul, and body. Okay, he talks about three things here. He talks about your spirit, he talks about your soul, and your body. That's why he says wholly or completely. He is looking at the whole package of you as being the spirit, the soul, and the body. Why? Because there is a work that needs to take place in these things. Now, right here in that passage, we learn a couple of things. First, sanctification or holiness is a process. Everybody say process. Process. It has to happen totally and completely. Okay, just so we're clear. It has to, and it takes time. Nobody can just whip up a batch of holiness and cover themselves in it. Doesn't happen that way. In fact, we're going to find out the things that you do do not deliver those things to you. Okay? Doesn't happen overnight. And this is why that I don't have a problem with a new person that's just come out of the tank and been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Did you know that whenever they receive the Holy Ghost, they repent of their sins, receive the Holy Ghost, been baptized in Jesus' name. At that very moment, you know they are as they will go to heaven as quickly as you will. Yeah. Right. right then. The Lord is never going to say, Well, they've not lived for me long enough, so they don't get to make it. The moment that they are saved. Yeah. That's what they are. Right. Okay? They, they, are, they are saved. And so we have to learn these things. We have to know that <coughs> they are as saved as we are. And they, according to Scripture, are just as ready for the rapture as we are. But if they live on this planet, even for just a little while, God is going to bring them along in this. That is God's plan. That is his desire. If they live here for a while, God...
God wants them to grow up in this thing. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 24, please. Let's look at verse number uh, uh, 24, okay? Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So, we have God's power to sanctify us. Okay? We have God's power to sanctify. It is not of your own power to do it. Without God, you cannot sanctify anything in your life. Right. It cannot happen. So, this is the only way that it can be done. Our spirit, soul, and body cannot be made holy unless we have His power. Now, not many people, to be honest with you, are very content to have holiness happen uh, in their spirit uh, because... They, they want to be saved. The Bible says that without holiness, no man can see God. Right. Okay? The Bible says it plainly. Without holiness, no man can see God. So, someone it also in their mind. Someone in their spirit. Someone in their mind. They want the peace of the Lord. They want the love of the Lord. They want the forgiveness of the Lord in their mind. But now, we talk about the body. How it affects our outward life. How it affects our appearance. How it affects our dress. How it affects our actions. And this is where many people today, uh, what they want is not always what the Bible says. In both directions. A lot of people don't want what the Word of God says in both directions. There are people today that will either add to or they will take away. In, in every one of these areas, nearly. And so, no matter how much that we, and we're going to study on this a little bit later. Let, let me get you to turn to a very interesting scripture. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse number 1. Everybody take your Bibles and turn it with me. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse number 1. We kind of have to look at the spirit or the age of the day that we are in. Too many people, as I said before, want to blur the lines. They want to make decisions that let go of, uh, of biblical principles. They want to take things and change them. They want to add to them to make them more difficult or they want to take away from them to make them easier. Well, you may not have known this, but there is a biblical prophecy concerning this. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse number 1. Brother Wallace, read that for me if you would. And don't read it real fast, but I want everybody to kind of read along with us. And in that day, seven women shall take a hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by that name take away our reproach. Okay. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying we will eat our own bread, we will wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now this is an amazing scripture that we're going to get into deeper later. Okay, Amazing scripture. But let's just view it on the surface for right now. This is the day or the era, the era that I believe that, that we are living in. People want God to save them. Let us use your name. Give us your name. But we want to eat our own bread. And we want to wear our own apparel. We want to, now, now I don't want to get ahead of myself, but here's the thing. They want Jesus to be their Savior, Brother Mary, but they do not want Him to be their Lord. They want Jesus to take away their reproach. Take away my sins. Take away my reproach. But when it comes to eating my bread, now this was a prophecy. The bread, the word of God, when it comes to eating of the bread, I will eat my own bread. I will dissect this and interpret this however I want to. I will wear, my, we will wear our own apparel, meaning we will live our lifestyle the way we want to. Just give us your name. You, you know, unless your head's in the sand, you know good and well that there's churches all over right, this place. Right. Even churches in this movement that have changed the way they have believed, even ever so slightly, and they don't they aren't realizing the spirit of the scripture. Now there is reasonable debate among many. There's a lot of debate among many whether or not that this is a similitude of, of what took place in Revelation chapter two and chapter three, of the seven women being the seven churches. Okay, there, there is a, a lot of good uh, information on that. But but even all of those that, that debate that and talk about it, they still agree that Isaiah 4 and 1 is a negative prophecy given about arrogant churches. It is a prophecy given about churches and or a people that are arrogant about what they believe. Okay, so it's the foretelling 
that seven churches, if, if we look at it from that angle, wanting to marry Christ, who do so only with a very selfish motive to get His salvation only. They say, we want to be called Christian, we want to be labeled a Christian, and we want to be called by His name. But at the same time, we want to do things our own way, right. and we want to stay in our sin. Now, spirit and in truth, the Bible says, they that worship Him must worship Him in what? Spirit and in truth. What is this? This is a type. It is a pattern. And it describes the day in which we live. I want salvation, but let me eat my own bread. Let me interpret the will, the Word of God, rather, any way that I want to. But I don't really want just that, that same connection with the Lord that they had. I don't really want that. See, that is not the spirit of the New Testament church. Everybody say amen. amen. Now, all three parts of man being uh, affected by holiness. All three parts of the being of man are affected by holiness. And that makes sense because all three parts of man's being is affected by salvation. It is with my mind that I repent and I ask God for forgiveness. And salvation impacts my mind when I choose to repent. It's with my body that I obey God's command and I am baptized. With my mind I repent, but with my body, that's why we don't believe in just, you know, saying, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and we're saved. When we talk about salvation as an apostolic movement, what do we include in that? We include a manifestation, a, a, an immersion of water that is a representation, rather, of the, the death of Jesus Christ. That's why we don't sprinkle. That's why we just don't, you know, split a little water on you. We physically take our bodies and we physically get in the tank. Right, right. Amen? Amen. Right. Why? Because there is a connection with what you do physically and what is manifested spiritually. Yeah. Always been that connection. Yeah. That's why that it's imperative. When people tell you, well, and, and this is the big thing today. Well, you don't have to, all you have to say is that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. There is no scripture anywhere for that. No. None. And, so, and they try to make scriptures look that way, right. but there's no scripture for that. What you do in the physical body is a manifestation of what takes place in your spirit. So when I'm immersed in, immersed in water, it's that physical action that has a spiritual consequence. It affects my body. When I get the Holy Ghost, guess what? That's in my spirit. So in the new birth, all three of these are impacted. My spirit is impacted. My mind, my soul, my body is impacted in the new birth. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. So we need to get into the facts of Scripture and see what thus saith the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14. Scripture says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness. Everybody say holiness. holiness. Now what I attempt to do right here is to get you to realize how important that the word holiness is and why we should never shelve it. Right. We should never put the word holy on the shelf because we feel intimidated if people condescend when we use that word. Right. Oh, well you think you're so holy. People say that. We all just think you're holy. Well, okay. Let's look at the scripture. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, you can interpret that verse in two ways because it actually has two shades, if you will, or uh, two shades of meaning. First, let's be very clear. You will not go to heaven and see God if you do not have holiness in your life. How do I know that? You just read it. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. You don't have holiness in your life, you will not see God. That's the facts. It's impossible. Why? Because God is holy. And secondly, no one else will see the Lord through you if there is not some distinctive that pulls you apart from other people. Holiness is supposed to be something that makes you different, and there's good reason for that. God's holiness is all throughout Scripture. When you begin to read from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the last word, Amen, in the book of Revelation, when you read that, 
God's holiness is all throughout Scripture. It's an amazing part of who God is. People say, God is love. Well, yes, He is. But you know what else He is? He's holy. He's just. He's forgiving. There's many attributes of God. But there is one, there is one that carries an actual consequence. Okay, ready? You cannot go to a holy place and be with a holy God unless you allow God to make you holy. Okay? You cannot go to a holy place and be with a holy God unless you allow God to make you holy. Now let me interject this right here. The word or term holiness, again, has taken a pounding through the years, mainly because of, of misunderstanding uh, in, in a lot of areas. And that could be uh, primarily because of improper teaching. But know this. We cannot get holy on our own. Right. You cannot. Right. Well, if I've got to be holy, then I'm going to make myself holy. Ha! Good luck with that, champ. Tell me how that works out for you. Because you're not. You don't have the power to get holy on your own. And guess what else? You cannot stay holy on your own. It is a constant work. Why? Because we are human flesh. And we will not be perfected right. until we are with Him. Amen? We Amen. will not be perfected until we are with Him. But just because people may have the wrong view of it, and just because people may condescend when they're speaking about it concerning someone, doesn't mean that it's not real and it should not be obtained. Okay? So, holiness makes us stand in adoration and awe of God. I want you to make a note of that. Holiness makes us stand in awe and adoration of God. That's what holiness is. Holiness is not a self-righteous attitude. Holiness is not so you make other people feel bad because you're better than they are. That's not what holiness is. Right. Holiness makes you stand in awe of God. And guess what else it does, church? It sets the standard for all other standards. Okay? You've got to know that. Before you know anything else, God's standard is what we go by. Right. Amen. Not man's standard. Not anyone else's. It's God's standard. That's what we live by. So, now, in the Greek, in this text, um, and, and I'm gonna, and I'm probably going to slaughter these words because I said them over and over and over and I had it down pat, but then what happens is you, you just, you get up here and it all, you know, it all goes crazy. So, in the Greek text, um, it is, the, the word for holiness is hagiasmos, which means, I'd be pretty good on that if that's uh, quite close, which means consecration, purification, the effect of consecration, and guess what else? Sanctification of heart and life. Look at number two. Look at number two. <coughs> it's consecration, it is purification, and then number two, just bam, right there in front of your face. The effect of consecration. It is that manifestation, it's what you see in the physical that happens. How, how would I know what you are. I, I can't, no man, look, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. No man knows, I can't tell you what's in Brother Barry's heart. But how he lives and how he acts gives me a pretty good idea. So the effect of consecration, consecration when it happens in here, then moves outside. Okay? Everybody with me? It pushes its way through. And it's very interesting because that's our theme this year. Consecration is to be what? Prepare for a work of God. So, by exact definition, let's do this. Let's not, we're not looking at man's ways. Let's go by exact definition. Okay? Look at the scripture. We're going to put that definition, exact definition, in the Greek, in that, in that scripture. You ready? Follow peace with all men and consecration purification, the effect of consecration, the sanctification of heart and life, without which no man shall see the Lord. So ultimately, wouldn't you say that it's important that you do the things and live a life of holiness as God portrays it and lays it out and teaches it to you? I would say yes. I would say absolutely yes. Now, don't tell me that God doesn't care how you live. Okay? Don't tell me, tell me that he only cares about the heart. True, the heart is important. In fact, it's, it's the most important part because without the heart being right, everything else is wrong. Without the heart being right, everything else is wrong. But a right heart will show sanctification and its effects in life. If your heart is right, these things will happen. So, 
Okay, here's the deal. I've got good news and I've got bad news. And then I've got good news again, okay? The good news is, is that God wants everybody to go to heaven. Right. The bad news is, nobody's perfect enough to make it, so we're all too late in shock, okay? The good news again is, thank God that He came and rolled Himself in flesh, took my sins, bore them on His shoulders, and gave me the ability to make it into heaven. Okay? Thank God for that. Somebody say, thank God for that. Thank God for that. Okay, so, God's holiness, because of what I just said, sets the standard. You cannot, listen to me very carefully, you cannot live any certain way as to get yourself into heaven. Amen. Not one article of clothing that you put on will save you. Right. 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 That's right. Not one thing that you do that you consider good and just and right, not one thing will save you. Right. It has no power to do that. It's not this church or some other church or some other denomination that sets the standard of holiness. It is God. So here's what happens. We don't make an apology, Brother Jesse. When I read in my Bible and it says, God says, don't do this, or the Scripture leads me to believe and shows proper proof and shows adequate proof, rather, that we shouldn't do this or that, guess what? I don't do it. We just don't do it. Do you know why? Because we want to please God. I've had people say uh, in times past, well, you know, it's only mentioned one time in Scripture, but let me, let me throw something at you, okay? We are spoiled brats in this generation. Spoiled, okay? All right, it shouldn't be. If there's anything that gets me more than anything as a parent right now, it's when I have to tell my children something more than once. Yes. Yes. Now, every parent here can say the same exact thing. There's not one of you parents here, no matter how old your kids are, can say, well, all my children's life, all I had to tell them was one time and they did it. You know what? You need to freeze that kid and you need to put him up in a museum somewhere never to be thought out again because he is a miracle. That's right. Okay? Uh, that's what needs to happen. There's nothing. What did I tell you? I told you over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Does God have to tell us over and over and over again? Yes, I think if God tells us one time, that's good enough. Yes. Right? That's good enough. There's so many scriptures on the oneness of God. But in reality, myself, I just need one. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's all I need. That's truly for me, that's all that I need. And, and we talk about this, you know, well, I need a little bit more than that to be convinced. Well, okay, uh, again, good luck with that. You know, we'll try, we'll do our best, but there's some people, if you, listen, if you want it in your heart, you only need to see it one time. Amen. You don't need to see it and then be told over and over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Amen. So, but I understand that, that oftentimes this happens, so... So, uh, and, and for the record, we do not line up with other churches. We don't compare notes with other churches on how we believe about holiness. Well, this church does it this way, and that church does it that way, so maybe we should all do it like this. No, we don't do that. Just like we don't pull out a commentary from somebody, and I don't care how good or how many accolades there are, you can understand that's still a man just writing. The, the Word of God is, is, is divinely written. It is divinely inspired, okay? Matthew Henry commentary is not. Right. Right? Right. It is not. It doesn't mean there's not good stuff in there. But you have to understand that there are things in there that are you going to yield your soul and your holiness over to some man's idea about it? No. You go to what the Scripture means. Go to what it says, and then you let the Lord teach you, the Holy Ghost leads you, and your leadership leads you, and all these things combine. Together is what helps. Okay, this is what gives you the answer. And so, uh, again, we want to please God. And, and for the record, you can go to the internet and find anything that you want to to agree with what you want it to say. Right. You got to just type it in. It's there, and you can read. You can pull it up and scroll down, and you'll find something. You'll find anything. So, all right, here's the deal. God sets the standard for His holiness. His holiness is always the highest of men and angels. Yes. Angels are holy, right? Angels are holy. Men can be holy through God's power, but God will always be the holiest 
of them all. Now watch this. Man, I got hurt. Watch it. Holiness necessitates God's condemnation to sin and God's opposition to all sin. God cannot be holy and you be unholy if you're going to dwell together. Okay? Now, let me, let me give you just a brief analogy. There was a black mark that happened uh, on man, all right, the, or in man, in, in the garden. Let's pretend that this is the black mark. Let's pretend this is sin. It's an iPhone. It is not sin. Let's just pretend that, that it is sin, okay? Yes. <laughs> it is not sin. All right. Here it is. Sin entered the heart of man. The sin that entered the heart of man, now watch this, this is the dilemma of the garden. Sin, which he hates, comes into man, which he loves. Sin, which he hates, comes into man, which he loves. God loves man, but he hates sin. Now, if he continues to love what he loves, which is man, then he will have to love what he hates because sin is in man. And if he continues to hate what he hates, then he'll have to hate man. So, because, because sin is in man. So now that's a real problem. But again, thank God that he came and lived a perfect sinless life and gave himself for me to take sin out of me. And that is the only way that it can be done. Right. The only way that holiness can be achieved is because of that. So if we understand that God is holy and He cannot condone any sin. Everybody say, any sin. Yes. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that. Write that down. God cannot condone any sin. He cannot. And He will not condone any sin. So what do we have to do, Pastor? We have to let Him make us holy. His holiness. Okay? When we look at it, his holiness makes us conscious of our own sin. It puts before us a very high goal to be holy as He is holy. So, in the whole council of Scripture, folks, there is not one Scripture, not one verse that says it's okay to not be so holy. Not one. You're going to go find it anyway. There is no Scripture like that. There's no, no Scripture that says it's no big issue. God will give you a lot of slack if you just want to go ahead and do whatever you want. And, I, I, and I'm going to bring this up a little bit later, but there's something really interesting. People say, well, we don't have to do all that because we live in grace. You ever heard people say that? We're living in grace. That's why, let me tell you something. I know you probably haven't considered this, but did you know that the grace standard of living was heavier than the Old Testament standard of living? Now that goes against what most people believe. Listen. The Bible says that if a man, put, that if somebody uh, uh, commits adultery, okay, that they were to be stoned, right? If you were found committing adultery, you would be stoned. Everybody say that's that's what the law said. Here's what Jesus said. You ready? You ready for what grace says? Everybody, buckle down. Here it goes. Jesus said that if a man looks on a woman to lust after her in his heart, he has committed adultery already. Right. right. Which is happier? Is grace the heavier standard? Or is the law the heavier? The law is heavy. The law says if you commit it, you're stoned. Jesus said if you look on her and think about it and it gets in your heart, you've already done it. Folks, and that's just not the only example. There's so many. Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law. I've come to fulfill the law. Okay, does that mean Jesus makes it harder? Well, I'm not saying he makes it harder, but I'm going to tell you what he does. He, he wipes away all the scales off of our eyes and He lets us see who we really are and that we can't do nothing without Him. And so when He asks me to do what my flesh feels like is the most difficult things, I'm going to do it because I know that it's not me doing it. It's His power through me doing it. I cannot live up to the law. I cannot live up to those things. But Jesus Christ can help me. Okay, so again, if we want to be a part of God's family, we've got to be a part of the rules of God's family. So that's what God looks like. Now let's take a look at man quickly. Man by his nature is a fallen being. Man made a mistake in the garden and that put sin in the bloodline for the whole human family. When you look at the man, we have lost holiness. There is none in us. Now the word holiness, I want, I want, to, take the, I know I've, uh, I want to take a few moments here. The word holiness comes from the earliest cultures. Long before the Jews or even the Hebrew race. Okay? Long before that. The origin of the word holiness comes from those particular cultures. And holiness way back then morphs into a Hebrew word, kodesh. Everybody say kodesh. kodesh. Okay? That's, that, that's holiness in the Hebrew. Later, it morphs into a word that we've already discussed, hageshemos, or um, 
Hogesune. That's what it is. Hogesune. So the early meaning of the word holiness is the word, a synonym for that word is withdraw. Everybody say withdraw. Okay, that is a synonym to that word kodesh. Okay, which incidentally, uh, kodesh, uh, I'll, I'll read that. I'm trying to get at myself here. Okay, we should say you cannot be baptized unless you're immersed in water. But by the same rule, you cannot be holy unless you are withdrawn. Everybody say withdrawn. You cannot be baptized unless you're immersed in water. We agree on that? Right. Okay. You cannot be holy unless you are withdrawn. Unless you are separated, which is another synonym for holy. Okay? That is the definition of the word. So by definition, you cannot be holy unless you are withdrawn from something or separated from something. So here you've got three synonyms for the word holy. Okay? Everybody ready? Withdrawal, separation, and sanctification. Now, you cannot be sanctified unless you are separated from something. And you cannot be separated from something unless you are withdrawn from something. Never let anybody, especially young people, never let anybody make you feel like you're an oddity because you are separated from the world. That is a requirement to be holy. Kodesh is holy. Kodesh Kodeshu is holy of holies. These are ancient, ancient words, folks, that meant to be separated or set apart. Being holy is not just withdrawing from something. Now, now let me tell you, there's a danger in extremes. There are some people that believe so much in separation that they come to church, they close the doors, they worship, they won't hurt. If they see a sinner or somebody that they know, you know, whatever, in Walmart, they'll turn their nose up to them, they won't talk with them because they're, oh no, we're supposed to be separate. Folks, that's an extreme and that is dangerous. That is not balanced teaching. Not balanced teaching, okay? Some people feel like being holy means we put up, you know, that barrier and so we don't, we don't reach out to anybody and, and, and then, uh, you know, basically we, we basically get trampled on because of, of the word 